Whoa, 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 we can't start there. First, we need to put the Artura in context. Right, here goes. Forget the F1, McLaren road cars properly got started in 2011 with the MP412C. Its start to life was as uneasy as its name, but McLaren, unsurprising given their F1 background, was a fast learner. Within two years we had a re-engineered version, the 650S, and the P1 hybrid hypercar. Then the company matured. The entry-level Sport Series range arrived in 2015, the 720S kicked off the Super Series in 2017, and things span off from there. Hardcore LT versions, Spiders, and the Ultimate Series cars, Senna, Speedtail, Elva. The rate of progress was immense, unprecedented. But something was niggling. Every car was built on very similar foundations. A carbon chassis tub containing two seats, and a twin turbo V8 mounted in the back driving the rear wheels through a twin clutch gearbox. Sure, there were slight variations, but buyers were getting wise. The promise with the Artura is revolution. So let me talk you through the tech spec and you can see where we're at with it. So we have a carbon chassis tub mated to a twin turbo engine behind it, driving the rear wheels through a twin clutch gearbox. Sound familiar? Yeah, it does rather, doesn't it? So where's the revolution? Well, it's in the details. That turbocharged engine is not a 4-litre V8 now. No, it's a V6, 120 degrees, with the turbos nestled inside rather than outside. The carbon tub has been completely redesigned. 82 kilos, but much, much stiffer than before. The twin-clutch gearbox has got an extra gear, and there's room for that because there's no reverse because reverse is handled by the electric motor. And if you're thinking all of this sounds quite familiar, quite Ferrari-ish, then yeah, we'll come on to talk about the 296 later. And then you have the stuff McLaren wouldn't abandon. Hydraulic steering still, and no regen on the braking because they wanted to keep the purity of it. But there has never been a McLaren you can do this in before. Two presses here into E mode, and you creep into a village on electric. No disturbance, it's lovely. No one's gonna get excited or upset. So let's pull over and have a look around the car. so you can get into town without attracting too much attention. And I know that's not the point of a bright orange supercar, but isn't it nice not to always have to be on parade? Anyway, we need to talk about the design because all this talk of revolution, but the looks of this are very evolutionary. Look, the nose is recognizable from every other McLaren. And those flying buttresses at the back, well, they're from the sports series, aren't they? But on the whole, it's a neat piece of design and there's some clever surfacing, particularly over this giant one-piece back deck. And look further down here as well. All that talk about aerodynamics and things, there's no active aero on this car, but you see these vents here that pull the air out from the front wheel arch and draft it down the flanks. There's all that trendy talk about gluing your airflow to the flanks. Well, you need to, to get it a, into the engine bay, and B, under these buttresses. And the reason you need to get it under the buttresses and out across the back deck is because that twin turbo V6 generates a lot of heat. Engine bay temperatures can reach 900 degrees. So there's a vent in the back deck to eject the hot air. And if you look in the mirror while you're driving, you see this column of rippling air rising from the, well, let's call it what it is, shall we? The chimney. So from the low tech to the high tech, petrol goes in that side. This side is where you charge up electricity for the 7.4 kilowatt hour battery pack down behind the seats. It can't be fast charged. It takes two and a half hours to get to 80%. The idea is you charge it at night at home and then when you're driving, the engine charges it because there's no regen braking. While we're talking about usability, let's have a look under the bonnet, shall we? So there we go with the practicality, 160 litres of space, room for a couple of cabin bags as I've demonstrated. Shall we have a look inside? Right, wait for the door to unlock itself. First point to make though, look, you have to get up close and personal with the door to tuck yourself down through the gap. 
But once in, the news is good. This car has the optional £3,300 comfort seats, and they are very comfortable, thankfully, and reasonably supportive. But for me, they are sat too high in the car. But although that does at least improve forward visibility, and rear visibility is very good too, and there's a useful parcel shelf back there. Just one thing about that, it tells you not to put anything on it. I'm assuming that is for safety reasons rather than weight-bearing reasons. The driving position is great. It's lovely having an unadorned steering wheel and the pedals are pretty much directly ahead of you, so you feel really natural in here. The only criticism I've got is that the instrument binnacle, which moves with the wheel in and out and up and down, is a bit big and dominant. But there's nothing really they could do about that because they needed to have the rocker switches on it for the powertrain and the chassis. That's an idea nicked from an old Citroen CX. And they show a more carefully considered approach within the whole car. The menu systems are well organised. There's Apple CarPlay, although it's not wireless yet, but this car will permit wireless over-the-air updates. There's useful slots for your phone here. There's a nice little rotary controller here for the volume. And there's useful cup holders. Look, there's one here and another one there. Plus, there's a big one in the door. And I know what you're thinking. Ah, upward opening doors. It'll all fall out when you open the door. But no, because it's angled so it doesn't. Right, I think I'm just going to have a quick drink and then get back on the road. So what's it like when you add a bit of pace to it? Oh, it's good. It's really, really good. The engine, for a start, the engine makes a cracking noise. It sounds better than the old V8. It's got this gruffer mid-range. But the benefits of carbon construction and the other lightweighting bits you see around the car, like the fact there's very few panels, it's just they've simplified it as much as they can, mean that the dry weight is only 1,395 kilos and wet, the DIN weight, is under 1,500, it's 1,498. And that's a heck of an achievement considering everything they've packaged into it. And it means that the car just feels really responsive. It's not hyper alert, but it is just the way it carries itself through corners. It's got that familiar McLaren feel, the stuff that the 570S and the 720S do so, so well, being light in your hands. And it's just this clean and uncorrupted front end. It feels really placid and stable. The braking is beautiful, but the braking's only beautiful when you use the brakes hard. If you use them softly, they needed too much pressure into them. It's like McLaren has gone, no, this car is for drivers. It's a little niggle, nothing more than that. Because if you add more speed, the car starts to come up to plane. The low speed ride is a little bit jiggly, even in comfort mode, which is what I'm in now. But as soon as you put some pressure and speed through it, it starts to just take on this lovely gliding factor. And I know we're in southern Spain and the roads are beautifully surfaced, but I found some howlingly bad tarmac earlier and it was still okay. No, better than that, it was good. So here's the critical thing, is it fast enough? Well, yeah, of course it's fast enough, but is it absolutely shockingly fast? No, it's not. It doesn't have the same temperament that the Ferrari 296 has. That has more e-power, that's got 160 horsepower of electric, this only has 95 horsepower, and they combine that in the Ferrari with 660 brake of twin turbo V6, whereas this is 585. So if I slow down, in the Ferrari, the second you hit the gas, it leaps forward. In this, you get surge rather than leap, but you go, you really go, but then there's this little lull before the turbos have spiked enough. There's just not enough e-power to really make that seamless and hard hitting. But, all the same, compare this with any other McLaren that's used that twin turbo engine and had those issues with lag, here you'd never really think about lag. And that's transformative. Two things worth mentioning here. Yes, you can drive on electric. McLaren says 19 miles, we say 12 to 15. Otherwise, it's not very efficient. The engine has to use spare power to charge the battery. 
But then this is a supercar. The hybrid is there to improve performance, not efficiency. Next one, the Artura feels a little constrained. Not in its speed, but the sense that it's been kept on a leash. This powertrain will inevitably find its way into whatever replaces the 720S, where it will be beefed up and harder hitting. As a result, there's a glass ceiling the Artura cannot push beyond. And that's not true of its nearest rival. So this inevitable comparison with the Ferrari 296, I know both companies say the cars aren't really rivals, but come on, they are. They've got near identical technical specifications, even if the Ferrari has, in the end game, another 130, 140 horsepower more and costs 60 grand extra. But despite the similarities, these two cars still communicate in the way that a Ferrari and a McLaren have always done, if you like. The Ferrari is super sharp, really vibrant and alert and really reactive, quick steering. It feels just alive in your hands. The McLaren is a calmer car, more placid. The noise isn't quite as, as vivid and exciting. But you know what? I'm enjoying listening to it. Let's take it all the way to the top, shall we? And now let's go beyond. Time for some track action at Ascari, where we have a different car, one with race harnesses, stickier Pirelli P0 Corsa tyres, oh, and the club sport seats. feels a different beast around a track. This is a wicked circuit. It's really, it's got such an incredible mix of corners. This is the club sport seat, which I think is the standard seat in the Artura and I much prefer it. It's got electric height adjustment, but I'm sat that much lower in the car. It's lovely. Oh, it's good grip there. That E-diff seems to be doing exactly what it needs to in the back of here. It's got so much lateral grip on these Pirellis. They're very proud of these. These are the new cyber tires that have chips built in them for all the pressure monitoring and everything. Well, are we up at the top end of third gear? Right, brake here hard and just ease off the brakes. Wow, it is playful just getting into corners on the brakes. Didn't expect it to be like that. Okay, compared with that 296, which is just a comedy, how sideways that is, it's not quite like that. But wow, it's effective. It feels better balanced, if you like, than that. And that means you can play with the balance, get the Artura to move around. It slides smoothly. The chassis has a wide sweet spot. The E-diff locks predictably. There's McLaren's VDC variable drift control to rein things in at the limit. And you've got near instant torque and response from the powertrain. Getting up it, 220, 230 kilometers an hour. And then hard on the brakes, very, very hard on the brakes. <laughs> they're, they're immensely powerful but I'm not 100% convinced by them. I still don't quite get the right pedal feel that I really want from it. That front end, you can really lean on it right into corners. It just doesn't give up. I mean, like the Ferrari, I always say Ferraris don't understeer ever. This doesn't seem to, it just fractionally loses a little bit of composure, but when it comes to grip levels, it's the rear that's going first, not the front. And what's great is there's no turbo lag to worry about. All that thing of thinking through in a McLaren that you'd have to be ahead of the throttle as you're coming out of corners, there's no need here. So on the road, I found that there was this kick of electric and then there was a little delay while the turbos were still building. But on track, because you're further up the revs, there's no issues at all. You just keep pumping through. I'm liking this. It's not as... What's the word? It's not like the Ferrari is a caricature of itself. This isn't. This is still quite a focused thing on trying to do the best job it can do. Wee! 
but it's very together. It's very together and fun. It's more fun here than it is on road. And I hadn't really expected that. Given how habitable the Artura is, how much the quality appears to have come on, I thought road was where it would shine brightest. But it has real bandwidth, feels noticeably wilder and more expressive on track. Yes, the looks are too safe and familiar, and there's still this sense that something is being held back, that a perimeter has been put around the Artura's performance envelope. But otherwise, this is a convincing car. McLaren has retained the behaviours we love and ensured hybrid is an active, useful enhancement. The next chapter in McLaren's story has begun. <laughs>